viewers, a warm welcome to you. Today, we have with us Sir James Brown. Welcome, sir. Welcome to Vidya Vastu and Astrology. And thank, thank you for giving me this time. It's been a long time. It's been so, a long time. Yes. Today will be an interesting session on all the sutras given by Braha, sir. He will be mentioning some of his sutras and the way to use them practically. Right, sir? Yeah, so, yeah, sutras. Yes. Okay. So when I give these when I give these talks, these videos, and when I write my books, I'm writing to address the issues that I come across with my clients and my students. Some of the things you will hear me say in many videos over and over, because I keep hearing them from clients. They read my books they and they watch the videos. So those are the things I address. Okay. So the perhaps the biggest problem with students learning astrology is that when you go to the books, the books focus on three things, three or four things. They focus on the planets and the houses. They focus on planets in their own signs and exaltation signs. And what happens is that it's not the it's not the fault of the students. They read the books and they think, oh, planets in houses, that must be everything. Oh, the planets in their own signs and their exaltation signs, that must be everything. Yeah. In the in the books, it's very, very hard to give as much attention to the aspects. And the aspects are everything. And the degrees are everything. The aspects and the degrees. And there's the only way to try to get students to learn about this is to, is to analyze horoscopes. So in my books, I have, I have some areas where I analyze horoscopes and you, you have to read those because in the books, it's it's very, very hard. You have a long section of planets and houses. You have the planets in their own signs. But but it doesn't matter if Jupiter is in Cancer, exalted, if it's right next to fallen Mars. Jupiter will be destroyed. <laughs> if Mars is in Cancer and you think it's terrible, but it's right next to exalted Jupiter, Mars is going to be great. Beginning students, they think that if the house is empty, oh, there's not much action there. This is this is just crazy making. If there's several planets in the ninth house aspecting the third house, they're all aspecting. That third house becomes active. If you have a Raja Yoga, let's say you have a Virgo ascendant or a Gemini ascendant, and you have a Mercury Venus conjunction, wherever that wherever that Mercury Venus conjunction sits is a Raja Yoga. So let's say it's in the career house. Great career. But that Raja Yoga is aspecting the fourth house. It becomes fantastic. Let's say you have a very bad house with, with malefics, Mars and Sun and Saturn. Uh, they're in the 11th house. But they're aspecting the fifth house. You understand? So this is... This is the problem. So this is the problem. People say, oh, well, I have my chart. But look at all the planets in this house. Yeah, but that's just a, a very, it's a, it's a minute part of it. But it doesn't look like a minute part of it. Now, here's a fascinating thing about this. The other day I was looking at a horoscope. When I print my Vedic charts, I include Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But I don't actually look at Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in the Vedic charts because I have the Western chart next to me because I look at both charts. So this, 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 this is really interesting because I always wonder, why do my students not see the aspects? Why do they not see 
the degrees. The sun is aspected by Venus and the sun is aspected by Saturn, but they don't realize Saturn's aspecting the sun within two degrees. Venus is aspecting the sun within within 20 degrees. It's a huge difference. They don't see that because they're not looking for it. So this, this is what's fascinating. I'm looking at the horoscope. I'm looking at the Vedic chart. And like I say, I don't look, I don't look for Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. They're in there, but I don't look at them. I'm looking at the horoscope, looking at the person's marriage. And then I go to the Western chart and I say, oh my God, Pluto is right on the seventh house cusp. It's huge. Then I say to myself, oh, is it on the seventh house cusp in the Hindu? Yes, it is. Because it's not always. You know, planets can be in different houses from the Western to the Hindu. But but the point is, Pluto is sitting right on the seventh house cusp. Then I look at it in the Hindu chart, and it's right there. And I say, well, how come I didn't see it? I don't see Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in the Hindu chart. They're sitting in the Hindu chart with all the other planets. The sun is somewhere. Venus is somewhere. Jupiter is somewhere. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto is somewhere. I don't even see them because my eyes are not looking for them. This was a revelation to me. Now I understand why the students don't see this planet's aspecting that. They don't see this planet is two degrees away from Jupiter. The other planet is 20 degrees. They, they don't see it because they're not looking for it. The same way I was not looking for Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So I don't see it because I look for it over here. So anyway, that's one of the things we're going to talk about. So, so you can learn all the planets in the houses that you want. You can have you can have the idea. Yes, Saturn as all planets aspect the opposite house, and Saturn aspects the third and the seventh and the tenth. But if you aren't looking to see how many aspects is the third house getting. In other words, Jupiter may be aspecting the fifth house, Saturn and Mars may be aspecting the fifth, but you don't see them if you're not looking to see how many planets aspect this house and are they benefic or malefic? How many benefics aspect this house or this planet? Here's a planet aspected by three benefics. Do you see it? Or do you just or, or do you just at one point in the in the chart reading you say, oh look, Venus is aspecting the sun? And then later on, you say, oh, look, Jupiter is aspecting the sun. That's not, you have to work on the chart beforehand and notice Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, all aspecting one planet. Saturn, Mars, Ketu, all aspecting one, pla one planet, one house. But you have to be looking for that or you'll never see it. Now, in my book, Ancient Hindu Astrology for the Modern Western Astrologer, this was the book that I wrote in 1986, but I updated it. I uh, uh, that's that's not that's a different one. The uh, well, actually, you, you could leave that up for a second. Yeah, okay, that one. So I updated this book in the year 2020. Everybody runs to read the planets in the houses. Everybody runs to read uh, what the planets mean, what the houses mean. There's a section in the back, it's probably 50 or 70 pages, analyzing horoscopes. And you read that over and over, and that's when you see how important the, the closeness of the degrees. That's when you see four planets. I'll, I'll explain. Look, four planets is aspecting that house. That's what you have to understand. So you have to read that section over and over. Not as much the planets in the houses. Also, go back to that first book that you put up there, The Art and Practice of Ancient Hindu Astrology. That is the book that I wrote about 15, not that one, the other one. That was the, that, that's the book that I wrote in 2001 after I had been practicing for 15 years. And this is the one where I analyze horoscopes and more horoscopes and more horoscopes. That's what you have to read, not the planets and the houses. They're good. But it doesn't matter if Venus is in the fifth house, if it's aspected by Saturn, by Mars, by Ketu. It's not going to function like Venus in the fifth. So that's what you've got to do. Okay, you can remove that. Now, um, 
when you're doing astrology readings, a lot of times you're going to tell people, oh, you should become a writer. The person likes it. They're good at it, but they don't do it. Or you should you you could tell a person, oh, you you should be you know, you should become a healer, whatever. When they are lacking confidence. So you're you're telling them what the horoscope indicates. You're giving them confidence that this is right for them. You're inspiring them. When they have very little confidence, they say, OK, how, how do I do that? H how do I do that? And I say, that's not my job. I have no idea. I have no idea how anybody is going to do anything. We can say, oh, go and audition for the film, go and try to get an agent, go and you can tell all that stuff. But nature, if you are following your dharma, nature is going to make it happen. If it's in the horoscope, nature will make it happen. But you have to be there, you know, with intention. If the client, if you give the client confidence that this is right for them, they will start to do different things. I'll I'll go to the library and give a lecture. I'll go talk to the, they will figure that part out. What, what our job is, is to inspire them and to give them confidence based on the horoscope, not based on, oh, I think that's good for you. The horoscope indicates that. So I was doing a chart the other day for a friend. Um, and it wasn't a full reading, but it was, it was for a friend. And th this person kept not getting something. And finally, I said, look, listen to me carefully. You are a great person. Look at what you have already done. Do you see what you've done? You should be going out and having a lot of success. Look at what you've done. She said to me, oh, my God, you give Shakti. She said, do you give Shakti to all your clients? It's a very interesting question. Because I don't hear from my clients now as much as I used to. When I was younger, they would email me, oh, my God, you said this and it happened. And you you got me into being an artist and you got me. A... I don't hear that anymore. But when I'm doing readings, I get very, just like when I'm doing this, I'm emphatic. I'm giving them the information of what, and I'm giving them confidence. I get off the I get off the, the session after an hour, hour and a half. And I say to my wife, do you think that this helps these people? She's God. Yes, of course it helps. Them. But I don't know if it helps them because I don't hear from them. But the point is, when she said, do you give Shakti to your clients? I said, well, I do exactly. <laughs> and and it's actually a good concept. Because, you know, in that book, the Braha Sutras that I wrote, my very last book in 2022, in that book, I say, your job is not just to explain that, you know, this is the information and this is the information and this. You have to make sure they hear it. They often, I did a chart reading a couple of weeks ago. I was telling the person, I spent 30 minutes telling the person what the next year is going to be about and what she should be doing because she had told me that's what she wanted to know about. I get about 45 minutes in and she asked me the question again, as if I hadn't, I said, what did you hear me say in those first 30 minutes? So the point is you have to give it to them in a way that they can hear it. Okay, so that's a sutra. So you're giving shakti, you're giving confidence. Mm -hmm. Don't, do not let them trap you in this idea that you can tell them how to make it work. You can't, you don't know how it's gonna happen. It'll happen the way nature wants it to happen. So I have always talked about looking at the chart as a whole, not looking at isolated pieces. Every So what happens is that people look, because when you start astrology, you know so little and you, you, don't, you don't feel confident. So you, oh, look, I can tell there's a good career. I can tell there's a bad marriage. I can tell, that's fine. But from the beginning of your practice, you have to start out looking at the chart as a whole and looking at the themes of the chart. Every chart will be different in terms of what the themes are. The theme comes from which aspects are good, which aspects are bad. Is the confidence strong in one way, but weak in another? 
could the person be a lawyer, but it's not going to make them happy. I mean, it's, I can't describe it because every chart is different and the themes are, the themes are looking at the whole. I always use the same analogy. When you go to learn to drive a car, you learn the steering wheel, you learn the brakes, you learn the mirror. If you miss one of those, you kill someone. You got to learn them all. When you're learning astrology, you got to you got to see the chart as a whole, not just the little pieces like you're driving a car and you got to start from the top. You got you can't. Oh, I'm going to learn the little pieces. And 10 years from now, I'll look at the theme and the whole. No, you have to start looking at the whole. Sit back and put it together. Um, and a, a great analogy that I like is that if you're if you're in a boat. You have a path. And if you are in that boat, you're going from United States to London. If you move that boat one degree off, you, you're not going to get anywhere near England one degree off because it's a long distance. So you want to, when you get to be my age, you want to be able to do something with astrology. But the way to do that is to start with the proper path. Um, I'm going to mention this. I've mentioned these things several times, but I'm going to give a little emphasis to it. In India, I don't know how it is, but in this country, you generally get the birth data from the birth certificate. And if and if it's not on the birth certificate, you write to the Bureau of Vital Statistics in the state you were born. Now, I always ask when a person tells me they're born at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, where the birth time come from? I'm going to tell you something. There are people who have accepted their parents telling them their birth time. And they come to me after doing using astrology for 10, 20 years. And all that time they've been using what the parents told them. And I say, well, have you checked the birth certificate? No, I don't need to. Well, I'd prefer you check it. They come back and they say, I can't tell you how much money I've wasted on astrology readings. I've been using what my parents told me instead of what was on the birth certificate. So you need to you need to let the people, the people don't know that it even matters. You've got to do that. There's another problem that I'm going to mention recently I found out about with jewelry. Gemologists in this country with gems. I have heard from gemologists in this country that Oftentimes, people that buy gems in India from Indian jewelers, they think they have good gems because they've paid a high price. They, After they wear them for 10 or 15 years, they need a different gem. They go to trade it. And he looks at it. They, they look at it and they go, where'd you get this? Oh, I bought it. It was $5,000. They said, this is worth about 200 So it happens. I, I love the Indian culture. I'm a Vedic astrology. You can see all the gods in back of me. But the Indian jewelers, you have to be extremely careful, extremely careful. Um, now, when it comes to doing astrology, the biggest problem is being gullible. Being gullible. I hear people say, oh, well, this must be, uh, this happened because of this, this planet was moving here, so it must have been by that. Oh, I had this happen during a dasha, so that dasha meant this happened. The only way, if you if you really want to get good, if you really want to be accurate, what you have to do is you have to play the devil's advocate. That means you have to be skeptical, not skeptical with what other people tell you, skeptical with what your own brain tells you. So, you know, oh, a person had a car accident, and Mars was going through the seventh house. Well, what the hell does Mars in the seventh house have to do with a car accident? Nothing. It's the fourth house, or if it's hitting the fourth house ruler, you can't just say, this was the Dasha Bhukti, this is what happened, so it must be the Dasha caused that. That is just crazy. For several reasons, it's crazy. Um it's it's just very very gullible first of all there there is also what's called mass karma karma that happens to everybody 
the country, the people in the city, the people in your group. Uh, for another thing, lots of things that occur in a horoscope will not be seen from Parashara. They may be seen from Jaimini and not in Parashara. But but if you can't find it in Parashara and you don't know Jaimini, then you say, oh, well, it must be this. Oh, well, it must be that. If it doesn't correlate with logic, the third house is the right ear. You got malefics in the third house. You got a, an ear problem. That's it. But if but if it's not something like that, like like uh, you know the person has an ear problem. There's nothing wrong with the third house. But you say, oh oh well, Saturn's aspecting this, so you got a you got an ear problem. You have to stop that. You have to stop that. You have to be serious and you have to play the devil's advocate. The person has a, a right ear problem and nothing's wrong with the third house. You say, I don't know where that problem's coming from. Do your parents have it? Is it genetic? It's not in the chart that I can find. Maybe it's in another system, but you have to be, otherwise you'll never get good. Otherwise you'll never get good. You have to be, you have to be able to say, I don't know why that is, but I know why this is. Leave it to somebody else when they ask you that, you know, with something you don't know. You say, ah, maybe somebody else knows. But hopefully those people are going to be serious. They're not going to be making it up because they want to be, you know, the gullibility is the biggest problem. Do you see divisional charts? Pardon me? Divisional charts, Varga charts. What about do you, them? Uh, do you uh, use them? I use the Navamsha and the Dasamsha. I've okay. never found, I've never found the chart for children to work for me. I use the Navamsha the Dasamsha. I do not use the chart as a whole. I've never found that to work. So you could have a career house, a, 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 a Dasamsha chart, and you have Jupiter, Venus, and Moon in the sixth house. You think that's going to make them a healer or or a cook or a restaurant? It's not. It's going to be the 10th house of the Dasamsha, not the chart as a whole. I know that's what people use. I used that for several years. It didn't work, so I didn't use it. I found that if you look at the 10th house, if the ruler of the 10th is in the sixth, you might have a healer. If the ruler of the 10th is in the third, you might have an artist or a mechanical technical skills, computers. If Venus is in the 10th house, there might be art. If Venus is ruling the fourth house and it's in the 10th, it might be land and real estate. You, you use the planetary energy, the houses it rules, and the ruler of the 10th and where it is. And you don't use and you don't use aspects and you don't use degrees. You don't use degrees, even though that's how I do it. And I get decent results. If I use the chart of the, as a whole, it doesn't work. With the Navamsha chart, I've heard all the stuff about the Navamsha. It's the second half of your life. It means this. And it's just nonsense to me. I look at the seventh house. If the ruler of the seventh is in the eighth or the twelfth, you got problems. If the ruler of the seventh is in the fifth, it's a past life connection because the fifth is poor of a punya. If the ruler, if the ruler of the ninth is in the seventh, it's a partner from a foreign country. If the ruler of the seventh is in the ninth, it's a partner from a foreign country or the partner's religious and philosophical. The, the first house ruler, you might use the first house perhaps because it's it's hard to imagine that, that the ascendant wouldn't work, but mainly it's the 10th house, everything about the 10th house, but not aspects, everything about the seventh house for the Navamsha, that's what I use. Um, eventually you have to use the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, or you're going to miss major stuff, major stuff. If you're going to be trying to predict the future of the world, mundane astrology and things like that, first of all, the only things that I really use for that mainly is the planets entering signs. Uranus entering a sign, Pluto entering a sign, Neptune entering a sign. But you have to use both systems. So in the tropical system, in 2008, uh, Pluto went into Capricorn in 2008, and the, the whole world economy crashed. 
Yes. You flash forward 12 years and Pluto goes into Capricorn in the sidereal system. The world shuts down in 2020. It shuts down because of the, the uh, pandemic. It's the same thing. It's Pluto and Capricorn in the tropical and the, the system collapses financially. Then it goes in the sidereal, it collapses. The same thing happens with the other planets. So Uranus, the planet of change, entered the sign of Taurus in the tropical system around 2018 or 19, I forget when. It was exactly when Bitcoin exploded from 2000 to 20,000. It's not so much that it exploded in price. That's not the significant part. It's a change in currency. Uranus is change, Taurus is currency. So what happened was because it went from 2000 to 20,000 for one solid year in this country, you could hardly turn on a television somebody explaining what Bitcoin was. During that year, the world came to know what Bitcoin was because Uranus entered the sign of money, Taurus. Now, Uranus is going to enter the sign of money, Taurus, in the sidereal system. Late May, late May of this year, Uranus is going to go into sidereal Taurus. You're going to see, again, a change of currency. Now, what I believe it will be, the only currency change I could see is Bitcoin, gold and silver, and the central bank digital currency, the CBDC. CBDC means central bank digital currency. What I believe will happen is that the government will announce there's going to be a central bank digital currency. And I believe the people will not like this because it takes away their privacy. Now all their money's in a bank and they don't use, they don't need a credit card. They just use the central bank. And, but everything you buy, like a credit card, everything you buy is going to be known. And then they're going to think, oh, then they're going to take our cash away. So I think what's going to happen is April, May, they will announce the central bank digital currency, which will be a change. And people will get freaked out and buy bit, take their money out of the banks and buy some Bitcoin and gold. And so I think you'll see gold and silver go up and maybe Bitcoin go up. Bitcoin has already gone up. Yes, it's taking up. It's already gone up. So I, so I don't think that Uranus and Taurus, I don't think that's about Bitcoin, even though Bitcoin is cutting in half at the same time. Bitcoin, the production is cutting in half, which should make, the, but I still don't think, I think that when Uranus goes in this time, it's the central bank digital currency, which causes people to also buy gold. That's what I think. Now, before that happens, that happens technically like the last week of May. But in April, in mid-April, Uranus, still in tropical Taurus, not yet in sidereal, still in tropical Taurus, comes along and conjuncts Jupiter, which is in tropical Taurus. So now I think you're going to see in mid-April, currency changes, and then the end of May, currency changes. But what I'm telling you is that you, the main thing I'm telling you is you have to use both systems. They both work. I wrote a book on transits, how to predict your future 20 years ago. And I remember, cause I use both systems and I, I had lots of horoscopes of people I knew. I had my own horoscope. And I said, when I talk about this, it's, a, it's mainly a book on Western transits, but I, I wanted to know, does it, does it work both ways? Yes, you, a planet would go into the sixth house in one system and you'd see changes in the workplace or the health. Then some months later, uh, the planet in the sidereal system would go in the same planet. Jupiter might go into the sixth house in the tropical in March, changes occur. Then in the sidereal, it goes in maybe in June. And again, you see the changes, both systems. Well, um, People ask, you know, they study astrology, they get the, they read a lot of the planets in the houses, like I said, how do the dashas work? How do the buktis work? 
if you understand what the planet that what the dasha planet is doing natally you're going to know how it works in the dasha so you can't just say oh i'm having a venus you're having a venus dasha venus is good it's it but venus is aspected by saturn and mars and ketu so the dasha is not good also with the houses if rahu's in the 10th house and you come to the dasha it's a career period if rahu's in the marriage house you come to the dasha it's going to be a relationship period it's but you have to analyze it properly you have to analyze it properly from the natal conditions to know how it's going to work in the dasha and bhukti scenario there are clients who will not benefit from astrology because the horoscope is i should say it differently there are horoscopes that are so afflicted and so difficult that it will be difficult for the astrologer to actually be able to inspire them, to give them something good to look forward to, to give them some advice as to what they can do. It's, it's rare, but they happen. And I won't lie to those people, but there are times when I say, I don't, I think there's, better ways i think you're better off going and doing some self-improvement courses or go and studying some subject that you like that you could use because the horoscope i don't like to tell them it'll be very depressing but that's what i'm talking about it'll it'll be depressing it, it won't it won't be helpful if you're being honest so there are cases where that occurs it's rare but you should consider you know that possibility you say look i just don't think I don't think astrology is the right, you know, there's there's all kinds of other disciplines. Astrology, I don't think, is going to help you. Yagyas. So the yagyas. I've been recommending yagyas since 1980, 83 or 4 when I started doing astrology because I see problems and that's the way you, you help. And... What most people are looking for, and you can't blame them, what most people are looking for with a yagya is a miracle. Oh, look, your relationships are not very good. You could do yagyas. Oh, you have a very bad career period, uh, and and the and the boss is treating you terribly, and you're having big problems. Try a yagya. And you get a lot of people who say, "I did the yagya, nothing happened." If you get a yagya from an organization that is honest and reputable, which I have two, I have one woman who organizes, she's got two organizations that do them and they work well and my clients get good results, but you can't always expect a miracle. Many times, and I mean many times during the yagya information comes, information so now when I recommend yagyas, there's two main things I tell them. Number one, if you're getting a yagya, I'll tell them get it for Mercury because that's the planet that's giving trouble. Do it for Mercury. And then I'll say, you want to tell the yagya people why you're doing it. I'm doing it because I'm having career problems. I'm doing it because I'm having relationship problems. But you have to be really specific with your clients that they not say, oh, well, I'm having problems in my career. And also my son is doing these weird things. And also, you know, my friends are. You tell them one thing. You tell them one thing. When you set up the Yagya, the person setting it up is going to listen when you tell them what you want. If you tell them two or three different things. When the pundits are praying, they tell the pundits, this person's doing it. They're doing Mercury Yagya. They're doing it for their career or they're doing it for this or that you don't tell them two or three different things. They, one thing. OK, but you watch the information, for example, about eight, nine months ago, a year ago, I was having stomach problems. It, it, you know, I didn't know what it was. My stomach would hurt for a couple of hours. Terrible. And then go away. Three, four days, three, four days later, it was it hurt for three or four hours. Go away. After about two weeks, I said, oh, God, I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to do a million tests. 
to find out what it is. Who knows how many tests you're going to have to do. But I get a yagya. I get a yagya. And during the yagya, I get an email from a friend who I haven't spoken to in ages. And I say, hey, I'm going, I'm going into town. I'll call you from my car. He says, how you doing? I say, good, but I got this weird health thing. He says, what is it? I describe it. And he says, oh, you got, um, uh, <laughs> what's it called? Gastritis. You got gastritis. I said, how do you know? He said, my father's a doctor. You got gastritis. The Yagya didn't heal the gastritis. It gave me the information. I went straight to the health food store. I said, I got gastritis. What do I do? They said, you take glutamine. That happens a lot. So when you so there's instructions for the yagas. Just tell them one thing and keep your ears and eyes open. Okay. Yeah. Now, when planets are conjunct or opposite each other in a house, Jupiter Mars conjunct, Jupiter Mars opposite, Sun. Sun, Jupiter conjunct, Sun, Jupiter opposite. Mars, Venus conjunct, Mars, Venus opposite. When you run the Dasha Bukti of two planets aspecting each other, it's the most karmic feature you can have. It's the most karmic feature you can have because it's two planets running their Dasha Bukti and they're, they're hitting each other. For better or worse if it's mars jupiter that's good mars is the dasha it'll get the good energy of jupiter if it's jupiter mars jupiter is going to get hurt by mars but the point is that hold on one second because i want to i forgot to say something that i'm going to mention <laughs> um so i'm going to give you a good example uh, marilyn monroe she had a great eighth house sex appeal and longevity. She had Mars and Jupiter. It was fantastic. But, but she came to Jupiter, Mars. To, I believe, If I remember correctly, it was a, a benefic and a malefic. I think it was Jupiter, Mars. She comes to the Dasha Bukti and it kills her because it's Jupiter in the eighth hit by Mars. It kills her. If she had gotten through that, she'd had a really long life. That happens. That happens. Um, okay. So those are, it's very karmic. Two planets together or opposite. The Dasha Bhukti, it's extreme. It's karmic. It's faded. When you say it's karmic, they say, what does that mean? I say it means that whatever happens, you got two planets in the fourth house. Whatever happens with mother, with land and real estate is faded and destined. It's not going to go by without, without a hitch. It'll be either very good or very bad, depending. If it's two planets in the 10th house, it's going to be big on the career. It's okay. So I have Saturn's son in the fifth house. And I don't think I've ever had. No, I have not. I, I, I've never had. Oh, no, I did. I had one terrible. One. Uh, I, I had a Jupiter Saturn Dasha Bukti, and it was horrific because it was Jupiter hit by Saturn and Jupiter rules the eighth. It was terrible. Very karmic, very karmic. And so recently I entered the Saturn sun in the fifth house. The fifth house is sports. The fifth house is children. The fifth house is investments. Now, I have, for some reason, nobody's calling me for videos. So when they don't call me, I don't do them. So everybody's calling me for, for, for videos while I'm in Venus Bukti which rules my ascendant. Maybe that's why. I don't know. I hit Saturn's sun. The Indian, the, the hosts, they stop contacting me. And suddenly, I'm reading books on baseball. I used to love baseball. The fifth house. Saturn, sun, and the fifth. And I'm reading, and I say, oh, God, my childhood. Oh, my God. And then I start getting heavier into investments and speculations heavier gold and silver stocks i'm buying now analyzing them spending hours and really enjoying it and then there's my son my my son julian okay saturn's son is in the fifth house it's in the house of children right 
whatever happens with sports, whatever happens with investments, whatever happens with children is going to be fated and destined. Now, from the time my son was little, the likelihood of him living in a foreign country was he wouldn't stop talking about Japan. And he was always talking about foreign countries from a young age. And from the horoscope, I could see he was likely to live in a foreign country. So it was no, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be surprised if he did. But when did he move? So he decides he's going to move to Portugal. And he decides a year before my Saturn son. He's working on getting a visa. He's going and checking Japan. He's checking Sweden. He's checking Finland. He's checking Portugal. But when does he actually move? When I get into the Saturn sun Dasha Bukti, it's fated. It's karmic. It's destined. So he moves. So he's in Portugal. So this is very, very important. When you see two planets conjunct or opposite, it's going to be fated. So you tell them whatever happens was really serious destiny. Okay. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention in the very beginning, when I was talking about forget the planets and the houses that, that we know that we're looking at the aspects, we're looking at the degrees, whether it's a close degree aspect or a wide degree aspect. But the other thing is a planet that's exalted is not the same as a planet in the highest degree of exaltation. The sun in three degrees Aries is nothing like the sun in the ninth and tenth degree of Aries. Jupiter in Cancer is not the same as Jupiter in the fifth degree of Cancer. Fifth degree means four degrees and some minutes. Once you get to five degrees, it's now the sixth degree. It's so the moon in Scorpio is bad, but in the third degree and the second degree, it's terrible. The moon in Taurus is good, but in the second and third degree of Taurus, it's fantastic. Venus in 10 degrees, Venus in 10 degrees Pisces is good, but in the 27th degree of Pisces, it's magnificent. There's no comparison. I'm giving Shakti. <laughs> um, people think that because a planet is a functional malefic, that it's weak. They think that if a planet rules the eighth house or it rules the twelfth house and it's considered, you know, a functional malefic, they think that it's weak and problematic. No. A functional malefic will cause problems if it's Venus, but it's ruling the eighth house, if it's ruling a bad house it will cause problems, but it doesn't mean that it's weak. The fact that it rules, the way I the way I describe it is a functional malefic, a planet ruling the eighth or the twelfth or the sixth. It's like a lion or a tiger. It goes around hurting, but it's not weak. It's not afflicted or weak. It's powerful, but it's causing some problems. And I don't mean that a functional malefic is all about problems. If it's Venus, if you take Robert De Niro's horoscope, his ascendant is, he's an actor, famous actor. If So his ascendant is uh, Gemini. Mercury and Venus, Mercury is 25 degrees in the third house of the arts, and Venus is 20, 27 degrees. So that's a Raja Yoga. It's a Gemini ascendant. Mercury, Venus in the house of the arts is forming a Raja Yoga. But Venus is ruling the 12th house and it's two degrees away from the ascendant ruler. It's going to make him famous. It's going to make him an artist. Venus aspecting the ascendant ruler, Mercury makes him an artist, makes him happy, makes him optimistic, but it also hurts the confidence. So with a malefic, I, I mean, sorry, with a, with a planet that is a benefic, if it's ruling the eighth or the twelfth and it aspects a planet tightly, tightly, within one or two or three degrees, that planet that gets hit by Venus will benefit because Venus is a benefic. It will also get hurt. There's no way out of it. Now, if 
if the aspect is five or seven degrees, you don't have to worry about that malefic aspect being serious. It's just not, it's not strong enough to do it. Um, the, you have to look at out of sign aspects. So if you have uh, Venus in 27 Libra and you think, oh, this is great. Venus is in its own sign. But Mars or Saturn or Ketu is in one or two degrees Scorpio. That Venus is harmed. It's not going to help that Venus is in Libra. It's a little bit better. But if Venus is two degrees from Mars or Saturn, it's going to get really harmed. But you may not see it because Venus is in this sign and the malefics in the other sign. But if they're two or three degrees, you got to see it. That's not so hard to notice if you're looking for it. But there are aspects that are hard to notice unless you're looking. So you could have you could have Jupiter in 28 Libra. You're looking for planets opposite Jupiter that would be in Aries. But if there's a planet in early Taurus, it's an opposition. It's an opposition. You have to see that. Good. Um, let's see. The moon. So the moon is the most important influence. Now, the foundation of the horoscope, you have to start with the foundation of the horoscope, which is going to tell you the person's confidence. You're looking at the sun, the moon, the ascendant, and the ascendant ruler. All of them. They could all be good. They could all be bad. Usually it's a mixture. But out of all those things, the moon is the childhood. It's the nurturing in childhood. It sets the tone for the entire life. If the nurturing in childhood is bad, the person's always going to be thinking, I don't deserve this. And I don't, they just get, they get used to compromising and not deserving. So that's extremely important. Also, when the moon makes an aspect, it only aspects its opposite house. All planets aspect their opposite house. There's no comparison between a dim moon throwing an aspect and a very bright full moon. I'm not talking about waxing and waning. That's not so important, even though that's how they say it in the scriptures. The importance is the brightness. So, like in my case, Mercury is in my sixth house, the house of writing and uh, the house of teaching. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Mercury is in the house of daily work. It's the planet of teaching and writing in the house of daily work. It's aspected by a full moon, a moon that is, I don't know, maybe one day, uh, one day after the full moon, something like that. Um, now, the, now the moon's aspect is not tight. Mercury is in my sixth house in two or three degrees. The moon's in 23 degrees. But that moon is a full moon. It's a very, not, not exactly full, but very, very bright, okay? So that very, very bright moon is going to have a very, very strong aspect. Because of that, it's going to have a very, so you have to look at, is the moon very, very bright? And the way that you'll know whether a moon is very bright is if it's a full, if the moon is opposite the sun, that's a full moon. If, if the moon is conjunct the sun, it's a dim new moon, has no strength. As it gets toward the opposition, that's a full moon. So that's, you know. Um, you also have to remember that, you know, I always talk about the superstitions of Rahu and Ketu because it's a demon, because it's a Rakshasa. They Rahu and Ketu have very, very, very bad reputations because they're a Rakshasa. For that reason only. I live on Mount Soma. There's a Vedic temple and there's, you know, spiritual people here that came here for meditation and stuff. And they got a little taste of astrology. We'll be sitting around the table and I'll, I'll say, oh, you're coming to Rahu. They go, ah, I say Rahu is worldly power, cravings and desires for power. It's not 
it can be very good. It has a very, very bad superstition because it's the head and the tail of a dragon. But Rahu in the career house is fantastic. It's good in the Upachayas, 3, 6, 10, and 11. If it's in the fourth house of land and real estate, you get a big house, a big car, big pieces of land. If Rahu's in the house of children, the fifth house, you get children that are powerful and worldly. It's not terrible. In general, Ketu is something that you have to watch out for. Because by nature, Ketu is psychic, metaphysical, astral, and otherworldly. All of those things are antithetical. They're opposite to worldly activities. So if Ketu is in the house of land and real estate, how does Met, unless you're going to have an ashram or have pujas done in your house or spiritual classes in your house, unless you're going to do that, Ketu is not going to help land and real estate. Unless you get a spirit, if Ketu is in the fifth, unless Ketu, unless you get a spiritual metaphysical kid, you're going to get a kid with alcohol, drugs, illusion, deception. So Ketu is much more difficult. Um, but Ketu in the 12th, Ketu in the 8th, those are great spiritually. Ketu in the 3rd, Ketu is film and photography. And the 3rd house is the arts. So that's good for the for film. Ketu in the 10th is good for film. If you, you know, or it's good for a spiritual career. But in general, you got to watch out more for Ketu. When it comes to conjunctions, there is no comparison. A planet near Rahu is actually going to have some some strength. A planet near Ketu is going to get wiped out. It's going to function on the astral plane, on the spiritual plane. It's not going to function well in the world. And when a planet's near Rahu, it's not that the planet becomes stronger. It's that in the Western system, Rahu is the north node, which is the area of life that you're going toward. My my. My south node's in the fourth house. My north node's in the tenth. So in past lives, I did home and family. Now I'm going to career. If there's a planet near near that north node, if it's Mercury, it's going to be very easy to access Mercury. If it's v, if it's if it's Venus next to the north node, it'll be very easy to access Venus. If it's Jupiter, it's very easy to access. It doesn't mean you'll go toward Venus, Mercury, or Jupiter. It means if you do, if you do go toward Venus it'll go easy, or Jupiter, if it's on the North Node. But but planets near the North Node, they really don't get hurt very much. Planets near Ketu get very hurt. Now, if there's a planet right next to Rahu, and, and Saturn comes in and throws an aspect as well, that's not good. Now you got two malefics aspecting. If you got Rahu near a planet, and that Rahu and planet are aspected by Mars. Now it's going to be two malefics hitting. Rahu as a malefic, Rahu as a malefic being next to another planet is not a big deal. Unless another malefic joins in. That's that's how I learned about Rahu and Ketu aspects. My teachers didn't use them because they weren't strong enough. But when I saw after three or four years, I said, every time Rahu or Ketu is aspecting something and another malefic, all hell breaks loose. That's when I realized you have to use the Rahu Ketu aspects. They aspect the ninth and the fifth, not the seventh. They don't aspect their opposite signs, they, but they aspect the fifth and the ninth. So I guess that's all I have to say today, um, except that, except that, let me emphasize again that our jobs as astrologers is to inspire people based on their horoscope, not based on our feelings. If the horoscope yeah. indicates this person would be very good dealing with the public because the moon's in the 10th house, you, you got to make them understand it. And you got to say it in a way, you know, I used to get psychic readings in my 20s and 30s. And oftentimes, you know, they would record the sessions and they would say things that I wouldn't even hear them because they just they would just say them. They wouldn't emphasize them enough. You have to make sure they hear you. And 
you know, when the reading is over, you have to make sure that they've heard the emphasis on what they can do, the good points, et cetera. This book on the on the screen, that's the Braha Sutras, which is that's the result of my 40 years in in the field that that has 216 sutras, all different, all different uh, issues that astrologers. I I try to talk about the issues that people don't know on their own from books. So that's got 216 different ones. All such books are available on Amazon. Plus, they are also in the form of ebooks. You all can buy them. I'll be attaching the links in the description box. Yeah, and, and uh, they can. can... They, yes. they they're all on Amazon I'm with the hard copy. They're all on Amazon with hard copies, and some of them are on ebooks. There's also there's also ebooks on ebooks only on e Barn ebooks on Barnes and Noble, Google Play, and um, Book Baby. But I'm telling you, you know, this is frustrating to me. I have a son, he's 24 years old, and three or four years ago, he has a friend who's into investing. I said, listen, you gotta, you gotta, let me say, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't need this book, I've read it 10 times. Let me send it to your friend. You know what he said? He won't read it. I said, why not? He said, my generation, they don't read. They don't read books. That's fine. But if you don't read books, you're not going to get astrology. You'll be able to do astrology psychically. You'll get a feeling. You've got an impulse. And you'll be wrong half the time. Because it has to be memorized. There's so much stuff that you have to read and memorize and read and memorize. And then, you, as I said, you have to go through the horoscope analysis over those sections over and over so you see how it's done. Okay. So, sir has taught you how to read the horoscope. Aspects are very important. Those degrees. Check out the aspects of the planets, conjunction of the planets. This is the gist of the session we had today. It was a lovely yeah. session, sir. Sessions with you are always so easy. Those yeah. of you who have not subscribed our channel, Please go and subscribe and watch so many videos by Sir. All his videos are amazing. People have loved there's them. Nine, there's, there's 90 of them. <laughs> there's 90 of them. Correct. And uh, we hope to see you so, soon, Sir. Yeah, my pleasure. I I enjoy it. I, I hope that it helps. And Yes, yes, and you can okay. you can connect to sir for consultations on his email ID, which is which will also be given in the links. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks.